What's up, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Da Vinci Cases. All right, so the way this works is we've got a clinical case followed by a board style question. So we're going to go through the question stem, point out the relevant clinical findings, take a look at the question and the answer choices, and then kind of divert for a minute and go through the relevant concepts to answering the question. Then we'll come back and apply those concepts that we went over to answering the question. All right, so we have a 27 year old male who presents to the clinic with facial droop, changes in taste, and increased sensitivity to sound in his left ear. So we've got a younger guy here. He's presenting with somewhat bizarre symptoms of his face. He's got facial droop. That's always going to have you worried for a stroke, obviously. The other thing coupled with these other symptoms that you want to be thinking about is cranial nerve pathology as well. So let's keep reading here to complete the picture. So these symptoms, they began suddenly one day ago. So this isn't some kind of chronic problem. And then they have no apparent cause. So it wasn't like this was some kind of trauma, like he fell or, or hit his head or had any other kind of blunt trauma to the face or the head. The other thing you could be thinking about, though, is that he could have an, a tumor that's undiagnosed that could be growing over time, and now it's gotten big enough to where it's compressing on a nerve and leads to some of these symptoms we're seeing. So again, let's keep reading to fully complete the picture. So he recovered from an upper respiratory infection a few days ago. These sometimes stems throw these in. They're Sometimes they're very relevant, and sometimes they throw them in, these types of things in as distraction because otherwise he's a healthy guy. Everyone gets upper respiratory infections from time to time. So let's just keep this in mind for right now. We can't make any definitive conclusions yet. No other significant past medical history, and he's not currently taking any medications. So he doesn't have any chronic medical problems. He hasn't any, any surgeries or anything relevant that we need to know about to answer this case. So let's go to the head and neck exam. He displays drooping on the left side of his face. You can see that in the picture here. If you look at the hat, he's got this drooping going on. That's consistent with what he came in complaining of. Extraocular muscle movements are intact bilaterally. So this would correspond to, you know, he's able to follow your finger on exams, and this would correspond to the cranial nerve three, the ocular motor nerve, cranial nerve four, the trochlear nerve, and then cranial nerve six, the abducens nerve. And so those are intact. The picture to the right shows the patient when he is asked to raise his eyebrows and smile. So very often on board exams, you're going to have you know pictures of patients. You could even have video or you could have sound that you have to listen to. And you got to be able to not be thrown off by these and look at these and be able to deduce what the question's actually getting at. So let's actually divide his face in half. And so let's look at the right side here. So you're asking him to raise his eyebrows. So that's going to involve you know some muscles here in the forehead to pull the eyebrow up. And you can see he's able to do that. He's got these wrinkles here corresponding to muscle contraction. At the same time, that'll also open his eye, which you can see here. And then with smiling, as you can see, you can see the curling up of, of his uh, lips here, of his mouth. Now, if you look on the left side here, you don't see these wrinkles here. You don't see the eyebrow being raised. You see his eyes even kind of closed here, so he's not opening it. And as you can see here, his mouth kind of stays in the neutral position. He's not able to curl it up to smile. These would all correspond to facial muscles or muscles of facial expression, which are all innovated by cranial nerve 7 or the facial nerve. So facial nerve, definitely want to keep that in mind here. So both sides of his face have intact sensation to touch, pinprick, and temperature. So it's, this is a muscular problem. It's not necessarily a sensation problem. And so this sensation of the face is actually provided by cranial nerve 5 or the trigeminal nerve. And then hearing is intact bilaterally. So although he has this increased sensitivity to sound in his left ear, Testing his hearing on exam, it is intact. He's able to hear. So it's not like he's lost his hearing. He's just sensitive to maybe louder sounds. And so this would correspond to cranial nerve 8, which would be the vestibular cochlear nerve. And then lastly here, it says there's no deviations in the tongue position. And so this would correspond to cranial nerve 12, which is the hypoglossal nerve, which is responsible for moving the tongue. And so this is indicating that cranial nerve 12 is intact. So they've, they've done a pretty thorough cranial nerve exam here. And really the, the main one that's jumping out at us is cranial nerve 7. So if we look at the key exam findings, again, left-sided facial drooping, cranial nerve 7, intact eye movements. And so again, his ocular motor ner nerve is intact, his trochlear nerve is intact and abducens. Inability to raise the eyebrow and smile. Again, that's cranial nerve 7. Facial sensation is intact bilaterally. That's that trigeminal nerve. Hearing intact bilaterally, that's vestibular cochlear nerve, cranial nerve 8. 
and then his tongue is in the neutral position, so the hypoglossal nerve is intact. And so again, this points us towards a facial nerve problem potentially here. So given that, we can start eliminating a few answer choices. So number one, atherosclerosis of the right middle cerebral artery. Again, when you have facial droop like this, you always want to worry about stroke. This would present with left facial weakness like he has, but you'd also see some especially upper extremity and even potentially lower extremity weakness as well on the, on the contralateral side. You could also see decreased sensation as well. The thing here is though, is atherosclerosis, he's a younger guy. It's typically not you know, going to develop this till he's much older potentially. And the other thing is, you know, there's no significant past medical history. So it's not like he's got some kind of congenital hyperlipidemia that could put him at risk at an early age. The other thing here is this doesn't say embolism. Because remember, younger people can get strokes from an embolism. Let's say he had a, a patent for amenel valley in his heart. You know, he has a DVT. It embolizes. It can cross, shunt across his atria there and then end up being shot up into the brain. So that's something you, you want to be aware of. But again, the fact that it says atherosclerosis, this is something that's more observed in older patients unless they have some kind of congenital hyperlipidemia. Next here, dissection of the left internal carotid artery. So this is typically caused by trauma because you have to have something that, that leads to this dissection. You know, it's usually manipulation or, or hyperextension of, of the neck can, can distort or some kind of penetrating trauma or blunt trauma to the neck. Um, these patients are going to present with Horner syndrome classically, which is, if you remember, PAM, P-A-M. So this is ptosis, which is drooping of the eyelid. This is anhydrosis, which is... Uh, lack of innervation of the sweat glands in the head and neck region, so you could see dry and dry skin. And then the other one is meiosis, which is constriction of the of the pupil on the ipsilateral side. So you'd see, you know, it wouldn't react to light. You would see very uh, pinpoint pupil. And again, there's no indication of this seen on exam. So I think we can rule that out. These patients also often will have headache or even neck pain as well, depending on the nature of their injury. All right, so let's take a second here to go through a few of the cranial nerves that are mentioned in the answer choices. So first, the facial nerve. This is one we're suspicious of in this patient of being affected. And remember that the facial nerve exits out of the stylomastoid foramen, and then it gives off branches, as you can see here, to all of the muscles involved in facial expression, as you can see here. And so it provides motor innervation to facial muscles, taste sensation to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. So remember our patient talked about taste changes. So again, this is even looking more like our culprit here. The other thing is it provides motor innervation to the stapedius muscle of the middle ear, and this helps dampen loud sounds or sudden sounds. And so it's going to, if this was out, again, like we see in our patient, you would see increased sensitivity to sound. So one of our other answer choices talks about a vestibular schwannoma, which is a tumor that arises from cranial nerve 8, and you can see that where it will impact typically the acoustic internal acoustic meatus, which you can see here in the, in the base of the skull here. Here's where it's blown up here. And what's important about the internal acoustic meatus is that this is actually where cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve, it's labeled acoustic here, but it's actually the vestibular cochlear nerve. This is an older diagram, cranial nerve 8. These actually exit the skull together through this opening in the skull here, this foramen. And so if you have compression here, say from a tumor like a vestibular schwannoma, you can impact cranial nerve 8 and cranial nerve 7. So you would see hearing loss. The vast majority of these patients have hearing loss or some kind of hearing difficulty, ipsilateral on the side of the tumor. And then the other thing is, they'll ha is they can also present with facial nerve uh, problems as well. So we'll keep this one in mind as well as we continue on. And then the trigeminal nerve or cranial nerve 5, carries out a lot of different functions. The main one, especially that are relevant for this case, are sensation. And so as you can see here, it's a major nerve and it has three main branches, which would be V1, V2, and V3, which are the ophthalmic nerve, which controls this dermatome of the face here, provides sensation to touch, position, pain, temperature for this region right here. So the forehead, top of the head, nasal area around the eyes as well. Then you have V2, which is the maxillary, which has this kind of upper portion of the mouth here. And then lastly, V3, which is the mandibular, which provides sensation to the lower part of the face in this mandibular region here. The trigeminal nerve also innervates the muscles of mastication. So with trigeminal nerve lesions, you can also see difficulty with chewing and eating as well. So if we come back to the answer choices here, let's go through these. So inflammation of cranial nerve 7. Now, you got to know these Roman numerals as well. You got to know the names and you got to know the corresponding Roman numerals because in the answer choices, 
you could see either one. And so you don't want to get to this point where you know what it is and then you don't you can't remember what the Roman numeral is and so you get the question wrong. So def definitely be prepared for it to be presented either way. So you have inflammation of cranial nerve 7. So again, facial muscle paralysis, loss of taste in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. You could also have sensitivity, like we said, to loud noise, which this patient has. Increased sensitivity to sound in his left ear. He has changes in taste, which would be anterior two-thirds of the tongue, and then facial droop. So this is looking like our likely culprit. The other thing here is inflammation. And so this is where him having an upper respiratory tract infection is actually relevant in this case. And so when these nerves are inflamed, that's particularly relevant when they're exiting out of these, these tight foramens and canals within the skull. And so that can cause an impingement of the nerve and interrupt its function and innervation of its targets. And so as you can see here, if you get inflammation of the cranial nerve, you can have facial muscle paralysis affecting your, and then loss of taste in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue and increased sensitivity to loud noise. So just to complete the answer choices here, vestibular schwannoma, this is going to affect cranial nerve 7 and cranial nerve 8. Hearing loss is the big one here. You're definitely going to see that. And here, the patient has hearing intact bilaterally. So although he's got this increased sensitivity, that appears to be more so due to cranial nerve 7. And so his hearing is intact bilaterally, so that would lead me to believe that his cranial nerve 8 is intact as well. And again, you could see facial nerve lesion symptoms as well, such as facial muscle paralysis. Lastly here, compression of cranial nerve V1, so this would be the ophthalmic branch. And again, this, these types of things, they can be caused by tumors as well, so like such as skull-based tumors. And what you'll see with this is loss of facial sensation to touch, pain and temperature of the forehead, orbital and nasal regions of the face. Remember the ophthalmic branch kind of has this, this region or this dermatome of the face here. And again, this gets broken up into sides as well. So, you know, the right cranial nerve 5 would control the right side of the face, and then the left side, of the left, because remember we have you know, pairs of cranial nerves, on one on the right, one on the left, and then the left cranial nerve 5 would do the left side of the face here. So again, he has intact sensation to touch, pinprick, and temperature on both sides of his face. And so again, it does not appear to be a trigeminal nerve lesion as well. And so it appears that our answer is answer C, inflammation of cranial nerve 7. And again, this is what's called... Bell's palsy, and there's a number of causes of this, but it's due to typically inflammation of cranial nerve 7. Autoimmune disorders can cause this. It can also be due to recent infections, such as an upper, upper respiratory infection. Lyme disease can result in this as well. You can also see this with herpes infections as well, and so a number of different causes. If you always want to pay attention to every detail, even if it seems minor, like an upper respiratory infection or some other type of infection recently that they just got over, you want to pay attention to those because those can result in different types of pathology, such as Bell's palsy. All right, that's all I have for you this week. Make sure you check back every Wednesday for new Da Vinci cases. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel for more videos. And then be sure to download the PDF notes for this video on our website at dviacademy.com. Also on our site, you can find our book and video packages for anatomy and biochemistry. And if you want to listen to Da Vinci cases on the go, the audio is available on Spotify. You can also follow us on Instagram for weekly posts and video. And then lastly, if you have any questions about the content of this video or about Da Vinci Academy, put them in the comments and our team will be sure to answer them. All right, thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.